need to have another pledge of allegiance. Everybody for roll call, Edie? Yes. Okay. Can I get a roll call, please? <laughs> Supervisor Gilmore is excused. Supervisor Bostrom, could you do a roll call, please? I'm going to go ahead and open it up to citizen comments. Anyone who would like to speak, you have five minutes to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. My name is Lou Molitor. I live at 3805 30th Street in Kenosha. And I am the president of the Kenosha Area Chamber of Commerce. I want to say a few words in support of your upcoming uh, discussion and vote on the resolution concerning Foxconn. I always like to start my words by saying today is a great day to be in Kenosha County. And indeed, we are in a good place with the bustling economic development, robust tourism, and a strengthening reputation as a generally great place to live, work, and play. It appears that Kenosha County is on the radar screen for businesses, tourists, and people across the country, and even the world, as is evident with the Foxconn op opportunity. Indeed, the economic development opportunity that Foxconn presents is huge, almost mind-boggling. Whenever there's talk of thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of investment, everyone takes notice. The Chamber is excited about the opportunity that the potential Foxconn investment presents. Excited for the county, for our citizens, and for the many businesses that can benefit from Foxconn coming and building in our area. Roughly 70% of our membership consists of small businesses, 15 employees or less. These small businesses, including restaurants, dry cleaners, florists, pharmacies, and many more, will continue to thrive with the added customer base that employees from a Foxconn business bring to the area. We are also extremely excited about the possibility of our I-94 corridor being the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. However, we know that we cannot walk around with stars and dollar signs in our eyes. The Chamber has full confidence in our elected officials at all levels to do their due diligence, research all the variables, and make good decisions regarding attracting Foxconn to southeast Wisconsin. This opportunity of a lifetime suggests great planning, great execution, and great celebration. The Chamber stands ready to assist with all three and will work with the county to make this opportunity a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molitor. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Stone. Uh, 1072 288th Avenue, one of the three owners of uh, Brighton Woods Orchard, which is one of the issues before you this evening for a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezoning issue. Uh, a month ago you heard this uh, issue. Uh, I was not here. Uh, not that it would have made any difference. The uh, issue is referred back to the Plan Commission to reconsider the issue, I think, mainly of the driveway uh, entrance to the property uh, off of County B, Kenosha County uh, B, or 288th Avenue. Uh, we have resolved, I believe, that issue. Uh, the issue was rediscussed at the Plan Commission meeting last week, and hopefully uh, all parties are satisfied, and we're looking forward, hopefully, to a favorable vote on this uh, this evening, and thank you again for your time. Thank you, sir. Any other citizen comments? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Jody Mirhoff. I live at 121 68th Place. Um, I'm here to speak to the two resolutions that are being considered by the board tonight. The first is the resolution to support fair voting maps in Wisconsin. Um, I attended a talk about a month ago with Secha Cheta of the Fair Maps Project. 
where he discussed the gerrymandering case that is going to be heard by the Supreme Court in October. What really struck me was the information he shared about the dramatic difference between the 2010 and 2012 election results in Wisconsin. In 2010, the Republicans won the state assembly by 250,000 votes statewide. As a result, they won 60 out of 99 assembly seats. That change reflected the will of the voters. In 2012, the Democrats had a 420,000 vote swing compared to their loss in 2010. They won by 170,000 votes statewide. And do you know how many assembly seats changed because of this huge swing in the vote? Zero. Not a single seat. The Democrats gained an additional 20% of the electorate that year, won significantly more votes statewide, and yet did not gain a single assembly seat. And what was the difference between 2010 and 2012? Gerrymandering of our state maps. As a result of gerrymandering, the votes of 170,000 people were not heard in Wisconsin in 2012. That trend has continued in subsequent elections. Fair voting maps is not a partisan issue. Maps can be drawn to benefit either side depending on who happens to be in power. This is a fairness issue. When I go to the polls, I want my vote to count and I want my voice to be heard. As county board supervisors, you are the elected voice for the people of Kenosha County. The Supreme Court will make its legal decision in October, but I'm asking you to go on record now saying that you support democracy in Wisconsin where every vote should have equal weight like county boards all over Wisconsin have done in the past few months. I'm asking you to vote in favor of the Fair Maps resolution. In addition, I wanted to speak about the Foxconn resolution being introduced by my county board supervisor, Terry Rose, tonight. I was very excited to hear about the prospects of jobs coming to the Kenosha area. But then the realities of this deal started to be revealed. $3 billion as a taxpayer handout translates to Wisconsin taxpayers paying Foxconn the equivalent of $66,600 per employee for each of the next 15 years. This equates to each household in Wisconsin paying $1,200 to subsidize this company. Hardly-Davidson reported sales of $970,000 plus per worker in its most recent annual report. By comparison, Foxconn's labor productivity was $105,000 per worker, which is very poor by American standards. And most of this labor occurred in developing countries with low wages. Foxconn's ability to remain profitable while having to pay standard American wages is questionable. Foxconn also has a history of terrible work practices and broken deals both in the United States and abroad. The nonpartisan legislative fiscal bureau shows tax Taxpayers would pay Foxconn about a billion dollars more than the state receives in tax revenues during the first 15 years of this project. And the state won't start to recoup those payments until 2043, 25 years from now. Why are voters being asked to subsidize a country, company that is one-tenth as effective as Harley-Davidson with their money? Foxconn is a company with a proven track record of not keeping its promises. Why should we have to wait a quarter of a century before we start seeing revenue? Will Foxconn even exist a quarter of a century from now? We live in a market economy. Companies are supposed to take risks and hire workers as part of that equation. But with Foxconn, all the risk and labor costs for at least the next 15 years are falling on Wisconsin taxpayers. This isn't free market economics. It isn't even cost effective socialism. It's corporate welfare. In addition, experts estimate water usage will run as high as 15 million gallons per day to produce these LCD screens, which is close to the equivalent of what the entire city of Racine uses in a single day. The impact on our environment needs to be understood before this deal is endorsed or approved. Wisconsin taxpayers are hurting. We need real economic development, not this handout of taxpayer money for the next quarter of a century. Please show you are fiscally responsible to the people who elected you. Foxconn is a bad deal, and I urge you to vote no until we understand all the repercussions of this. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Yes. My name is Patricia Klein, K-L-E-I-N. 
My husband Larry, a disabled veteran, is not able to be here tonight, and we live at 616 79th Street in Kenosha. Both my husband and my father were active military during the Vietnam conflict and World War II. Speaking for myself, I love history, especially American history. Our country fought a revolutionary war to become an independent nation. We fought a civil war to end slavery and to keep our country united. And although there have been many battles, conflicts, and even world wars, we have grown as a country, as a leader to the world in economics, industry, science, and as a great example of what freedom stands for. Our current administration in Washington, as well as in Wisconsin, is, in my opinion, not maintaining that example to the world. We are not growing as a country or as a world leader. Our national and state governments seem to be at a tipping point in determining what it means to care about our citizens and our place in the world. One of our freedoms that is in peril is voting rights. Women fought for the right to vote. Black people put their lives on the line fighting for civil rights. All of us are citizens no matter our color, religion, or political party. We should not have to jump through hoops to prove that we have the right to vote for our chosen representatives. Gerrymandering, voter ID, restricted voting places and hours do not make us a better, stronger country. It is, in its very definition, a disgraceful form of discrimination. If we do not have free and fair elections, if we do not impose honesty and funding limits in political campaigns, if we do not, in fact, make voting easier for our citizens to cast their votes, to elect those who will lead us, then I'm sorry, but we are no longer free. I urge you to pass the gerrymandering resolution before you, to stand on the side of the people of Kenosha, to let this resolution stand as the voice of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, my name is Rebecca Stevens, 4511 Fifth Avenue. I'm here this evening to speak in favor of the uh, resolution that's brought forward by uh, County Board Member Leah Blau. Uh, gerrymandering is a huge issue in the state. It suppresses votes, which we already have a voter suppression issue in the state. It also creates unbalanced situations for many of our communities because they have no voice. I'm going to share a quick story with you the first time I ever went to vote and what happened and how it impacted me as an individual and how I stood up against it. It was way back in the day when we wanted to get Bradford High School built. I was so excited, I was 18 years old. My first time to vote, I get to vote on something that actually was connected to me personally. I go, the curtain gets jammed, the machine's jammed, and I'm like, hmm, couldn't get it to work. Called the poll worker over and I watched as she went in, switched my vote, and all of a sudden, voila, the, the magic machine worked. I got out on the sidewalk, talked to my parents, and said, look, this is what happened. What do I do? Fortunately, my father knew to call the mayor and was able to get me a, a chance to vote again. So my vote counted. This is one person, one individual, that wasn't going to back down. We have so many people, and there is so much discrimination surrounding voting in the state that if you can't help us by passing this resolution, as other county boards have, it will be a disgrace to Kenosha County. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. It's just disgraceful when we don't stand up for everybody's right in this country to vote. OK, I'm getting a little passionate here. I know that, because that's who I am. I'm not going to go over all the details with Foxconn, and I want to thank Jody for how she covered it so well. But I have many, many concerns. As you know, I've been on the school board for 11 years now. 
One of the first things that hit the school board was called the CDO. That was one of the first huge scams that I had to deal with as a school board member. Anything that sounds way too good, folks, you better ask a lot, a lot of questions. And I am all for economic development in our city, in our state. But please ask for transparencies from those people at the top that are asking for $3 billion. $3 billion. We need to hold them accountable. They need to answer to us. And I, it, I mean, I think it's great to have a resolution, but there were many things, Mr. Rosen, you're my, my county board supervisor, and I appreciate all the years of service, but you're educated. I need you to ask more questions. I need all of you to ask more questions about this deal so that we can secure a really good deal for Kenosha, Racine, our state, wherever it ends up. I believe that there's possibilities here I just think we need to ask for more information. I want to thank you all for your service, and I want to ask you to please, please reconsider before you pass the Foxconn resolution. And please help support all people in our country and in our state by passing this bill, this resolution, to end the gerrymandering in our state. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Lori Hawkins and my address is 18513 102nd Street, Bristol. Um, I would like to speak on the gerrymandering resolution that has been brought forth by, um, by Supervisor Blau. Um, our maps in Wisconsin for voting are extremely gerrymandered by definition. This is a nonpartisan issue because it affects everyone eventually. It may serve one side now and it's going to serve another side in the future. I'm asking that the board simply show support and pass this resolution to show that we are one of the counties that stands up to say no more tax dollars are going to be spent to, um, to, to fight the court's decision that our, that our maps be rewritten. That we support that fair maps are maps that all Wisconsinites deserve in our state. So that's it, just that the board supports this resolution to say no more gerrymandered maps. And as far as the Foxconn resolution goes, it's true that bringing jobs to Kenosha County is a huge priority. And there are a lot of people who are, are desperate for the opportunities to come. However, I don't believe that that desperation should allow us to rush into something that is such a huge financial responsibility and possible empty burden in the end for us. Foxconn's track record is not one that proves that it has been good for communities all the time. They have provided broken promises that have been expensive to taxpayers. And not only has some of their involvement been expensive to taxpayers, it's been detrimental to the environment. Um, there's already so much pollution and poor air quality in our community that I feel that before we rush into something that is a possibly very detrimental to our environment that we take a closer look at all the water use, um, the pollution, and jobs that are, may be coming but might not necessarily even go to the members of our community. So I ask that um, we just slow down and take a, take a closer look and vote no on that. Thank you. Thank you. Citizen comments? Any other citizen comments? Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Julia Kozel. I live at 9507 68th Street. Um, I am speaking today because I'm appalled with the current Wisconsin state elections maps. I'm not going to rehash all the specifics with you because I know that you're aware, but I will say that this absolutely affects every single one of us, either now or at some point in the future. And I urge you to vote in favor of the resolution to support fair maps in Wisconsin. The second issue I'd like to speak about is the vote on the dock today for Foxconn. I'm obviously in favor of bringing jobs and industry to Wisconsin and specifically to Kenosha County. 
That being said, we need to look at the opportunity costs here. I feel like this vote is premature and I would urge you to either table this discussion or vote against this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. comments? Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Carol Baim. I live at 5015 Springbrook Road, uh, Pleasant Prairie. Um, the first topic is the gerrymandering issue. issue. Um, the only thing I would like to say on that is that we should all be a person, not a percentage of a person. And some districts shouldn't be three times more powerful than other districts. We have a problem, we see that problem when it comes to the national elections, that many people in some states just do not vote because they feel that their vote, their um, state is overwhelmingly in one direction, whether that's um, you know, conservative or, or Democrat or Republican, they feel that their state is already locked in, so why bother? Well, gerrymandering brings that down to the local level. People need to be involved. Whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, get out, they need to be out there and vote. And when you gerrymander, whether it's done by one side or the other, it creates a problem that people don't feel that their vote is going to count. So, you know, it, it helps both sides if this problem was corrected. Um, the second topic I'd like to talk about is the Foxconn. Um, with kind of the, inf the emphasis on con, it sounds really great. Um, but my, my first big job out of college, I started work in 1988 with Motorola in Franklin Park, Illinois. I spent 28 years in the electronics industry. And I was responsible for the purchase and implementation of test equipment and manufacturing equipment and other manufacturing type um, applications. And we had to cost justify everything we put in place. So I know the labor rates between here and Mexico and China and Taiwan. My, I spent eight weeks implementing a system in Taiwan. The numbers they're quoting the big story they're telling is political theater. I'm sorry, but the numbers do not add up. And they can say that, okay, well, we're gonna have lots of robots. Lots of, well, okay, so there's gonna be 3,000 jobs, there's gonna be 3,000 jobs, because that's the real number, and lots of robots. And, and we have this whole list of exceptions we want for the environment. And here's where, I, again, I spent more than eight weeks in Taiwan, but there was eight weeks at a stretch. Beautiful country, lovely people. But my first impression when I got, uh, when the cab drove us to Chung Lee was, wow, this is Blade Runner. It was that thick and heavy with pollution. It was choking. There was coal-fired smoke. There was raw sewage in the streets. It, it took me about four weeks and then my brain kind of like turned off and then, then I could like live with it and then I didn't even notice it. So I think they could come here and they would put their plant in, but they would have no idea that they're probably like, this is great. I don't want a Taiwan quality environment here. Um, and <laughs> if you look at the electronics industry, again, this is with Motorola, there, there's, there's a million different toxic chemicals. I, I shouldn't say a million, that's overplaying the number of chemicals out there. But there's cadmium, mercury, lead, and they are all used throughout manufacturing, and you have to closely control those. The fact that they're walking up and they're saying right off the bat, hey, look the other way, says there's something very wrong there. And you notice, okay, this is the benefit Paul Ryan and 
Scott Walker. They are getting the big headlines out of this. It's not in their backyard though, is it? It's not in Janesville. It's not wherever Scott Walker lives. It's in our backyard. And so I say, you know, I understand that this has gotten big headlines because there's been a lot of big press releases, but the reality is going to be not so easy to live with if it actually does come to pass. And it would probably be best, frankly, to have it in Racine County. Let them have their uh, water utility system being thrashed by, by heavy metals. Let them pay the cost of cleanup. Let them pay the cost of infrastructure updates that are not paid for. Please wrap up your comments. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Sorry, it's a long name here. I'll just pleasant period. Oh, oh, there. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Esther Roberts Inkahas. My address is 923 Wood Road in um, Kenosha, the Summers. Um, first, I want to ask you to vote in favor of the fair voter maps. Um, for sure, that's one of the reasons I came. Um, it, I mean, everybody's already said it, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I was hoping that you would vote in favor of that as well. Um, also, I wanted to talk about Foxconn. Um, I went to the um, listener session in Milwaukee over the weekend, and they came up with some really good points I wanted to bring up to you. I'm, I'm sure that you've all thought it through, but um, it never hurts to go over things again, especially when things are being forced through, um, not taking time and not knowing all the answers. Um, even if everything were to go 100% right, um, i.e. hiring all Wisconsin workers, the number of jobs promised is met, and the proposed number of businesses to be brought into the community is met, et cetera, Wisconsin won't break even for at least 25 years, and that's if everything's perfect. So I'm looking way beyond 25 years. This bill is a dangerous precedent for what Wisconsin must promise to other companies looking to move into the area. This is not an economic development plan. This is one deal, and it's not a good one. Um, there were just a few things that they were asking for, I, I think, yesterday at the committee um, uh, vote, just a starting wage to be $15 an hour and to increase um, with how, when you, you know, for cost of living. And that's not too much to ask. Um, also, for environmental protections, and at least to know what it is that they want to not do to the environment or do to the environment, those, we don't even know what would happen or we don't even know what, you know, what they want to bring. We just, we don't know enough. I guess that's my point. We don't know enough to say yes right now. We also asked, um, well, they asked, and they were hoping to ask that at least 70% of those hired must be from Wisconsin. I mean, this is about Wisconsin, right? So they should hire Wisconsinites. Right now, the bill just reads that Foxconn will hire a practical amount of Wisconsin workers. What does that mean? That, that doesn't mean anything. So just asking for those few things and getting turned down on those yesterday, I don't know. I think that I think it needs to be thought through more. I I think it sounds too good to be true. I think it should be either tabled or voted no for now. Um, if they can, you know, come to some agreement on on these basic things that we're asking for, then maybe yes, but not now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Please state your name and address. Uh, hello, my name is Omar Flores, and I live at 5800 80th Place, Kenosha. Uh, I've come here to talk about the Foxconn deal. Um, I've been reading a lot about it in the news, and I think it's great that you guys are able to listen to people here in the community. 
and uh, just something on a national level is coming so uh, close to home. So a lot of what I wanted to talk about today is sort of related to, um, I guess, people's motives, and especially under capitalism. So any rational capitalist would not make any kind of move that would um, deter their profits, for example, okay? So when you look at an example of this, um, manufacturing left the US at a pretty large scale to China, Taiwan, uh, multiple third world countries where there's cheap labor, and that's rational for a company to do because who wants to pay more for labor? If you could pay less, I think anyone that's a business owner would do that. Um, the fact that they're wanting to come to Wisconsin and supposedly pay $20 an hour uh, sounds absurd when they're paying around $4 or less uh, an hour uh, for labor in China and Taiwan and multiple third world countries. So I think we have to approach this deal with a degree of skepticism given that in order to make up for that huge distance and what they're paying for manufacturing labor, um, I, I think that it's absurd to think that we should bankroll that kind of difference. Um, I mean, we, I hear a lot of right-wing talking points talking about how um, absurd it is that we have to pay for supposedly lazy people that uh, don't want to find a job, or even working families that are working minimum wage that are receiving government aid, that we shouldn't fund them. But here we are wanting to fund a multinational corporation, uh, which um, is owned by a billionaire. Um, Terry Gao referred to his workers as zoo animals. He, he talked to a zoo manager for advice on how to control his workers. So I would say this is massively irresponsible for anyone to vote for this kind of deal. But um, again, I think people act in self-interest. I think the reason why this is going so fast through is because uh, Scott Walker and Paul Ryan want a, um, you know, just something to put up there. It's basically a resume builder. And, um, you know, I mean, when you think about like uh, people like Paul Ryan that cite Ayn Rand as his influence, um, Ayn Rand is a free market capitalist and she would have a conniption if she found out that a supposed right winger was giving billions of dollars to a multinational corporation. So I don't see any kind of reason why somebody would want to vote for this whether you're right wing or left wing. I mean what side do you really stand on? You know, I mean if you don't have a right wing ideology, uh, that's fine. If you have a left wing ideology, that's fine. But if you're not subscribing to either of those things, you're subscribing to self-interest. And I think that becomes very clear when you stray from what you supposedly stand for. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Citizen comments. Please state your name and address. Terrence Worthen, uh, 7832 14th Avenue, Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm going to speak on the Foxconn resolution and the gerrymandering resolution. About Foxconn, I've been in American manufacturing, manufacturing management for 20 years. I started General Motors, then I moved on into shipbuilding, like my home state of Virginia. Spent about seven years building nuclear reactors for fast attack submarines and Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. So I've worked, been lucky enough to work, at the pinnacle of American manufacturing in my career. If you want to get in touch with me at my office 20 years ago, and I was somewhat mobile, you could have gotten in touch with me on the nicest of pagers, and I would have called you back on a landline. The idea that you're going to go out on this tightrope and gamble that this company will be afloat, let alone the technology that they produce, which is in a very narrow bandwidth, in 35 years is insane. Where are the people that were manufacturing those pagers 35 years ago? Who was building your, your landline phone 35 years ago? Do you think they're still working the same factory? They have their pensions, good wages, think they're still open? They're not. You want to walk across a tightrope, I'd rather walk across a bridge. I heard a reference earlier this evening to Silicon Valley. And that is a great idea and a great inspiration for southeastern Wisconsin. You might have the ability to do that if you invest in infrastructure and education. Silicon Valley is a culture, and it is also diverse. If Foxconn is so suited to southeastern Wisconsin, and you think you're going to build Silicon Valley around that, why is it only Foxconn? Why aren't there 20 companies beating down your door? 
Have you thought about that? Why such a large investment from one instead of collective investment from many? Has that crossed anyone's mind? Throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to choose locations for factories and to establish supply chains. We don't go where it's good for you. We go where it's good for us. We go where we have control. We go where we have leverage. We go where we can manipulate. We go where we can control the workforce and the tax base and the people that decide those things. That is all this is about. These will not even be jobs that are based in Kenosha. By design, they will not be. There's a reason it's this close to the border. Because if we ever do wake up to a situation we don't like, they can simply shift their focus south. We have Amazon out by I-94 now. You're busing people in from Milwaukee, and you can't staff it. You're not going to pay any more at Foxconn on an assembly line than you will at Amazon. They will automate. They will shrink their workforce to nothing. You'll be left holding the bag. And the billionaires that run it now won't be there 35 years from now. They're going to cash out and leave. We'll still be here, dealing with most likely a toxic site that no one else will want. And just like Chrysler, we'll be looking for another single source of employment if we let this go through. There is nothing about this that is meant to benefit you or I or anyone else in this community. If you want Silicon Valley, that is a much broader investment and much bigger thinking than clinging to the one company that's willing to come to town and invest this much. That's all I have to say about Foxconn. On gerrymandering, this is not about just the map. This is about actually being functional. We are so tired at all levels of our government of the, of the lack of bipartisanship. We're sick of it. From, from all of it, every level, federal, state, we at least hope that our local government, our neighbors, can function decently together. The people that see each other at the grocery store and the gas station, whose kids play Little League and play at Castle together, they can at least be decent enough to want fairness for each other. That is what this is about. It is not about the maps. It is about making the statement that you're at least willing to be adults and care about your community. That's all this is. Everyone has skin in this game. Both parties are guilty of it. The finger pointing doesn't impress anyone. We are asking you to actually work together and to make a symbolic gesture that we are a functioning community, a functioning government that cares about fairness in all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing none, citizen comments are closed. Just want to recognize the youth and governance that we have here tonight. We have Julia Arturi from PDEC over on the right to your left. Isabella Ricker is from Legislative. Janaki Rawal is from Joint Services as well as Jamal Hansen. And on the other side we have a former youth and governance, Dustin Bath. All right, let's go on with uh, supervisor reports. Supervisor Alverman, you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm going to briefly run through some ongoing projects I've been reporting on. The uh, first thing I do want to mention, though, is, is uh, thanking everyone that helped make the uh, 90th year anniversary celebration of the county park system such as success uh, at uh, Petrifying Springs on uh, August 5th, Saturday. It was uh, better than we could have expected. Mr. Collins did an extraordinary job and our uh, partners in uh, sponsorship, local sponsors uh, and uh, people from out of town that made it such a success. I know that quite a few of you were out there and uh, it, was, uh, it was just a, a perfect day, so thank everyone. Courthouse fire alarm system is complete. 
I've been reporting on that. Um, and it's been signed off by the uh, local fire department. The uh, generator replacement at the public safety building should be done by the end of the month. Some more state inspections that need to be done. Safety building, the uh, second floor, everything is tied into to our new um, uh, building and, and work across the street for the fleet maintenance. And that work was slowed by the weather. We're about three weeks behind on that. Court remodeling for branch four, we're looking at a mid-October start uh, because we are going with our second contractor. The uh, little bit of uh, good news is that the the bid bond uh, insurance, we checked into it from the first contractor. We we're getting a, a $5,000 rebate from the, uh, the company that bonded those people. Uh, Brookside, the demolition is complete on the old building and uh, we're in full construction mode there to, uh, to get that, that whole campus on, uh, on track. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the flood report for Kenosha County as far as uh, highways, parks, and, uh, and uh, maintenance and, uh, and our buildings uh, damages uh, that we ourselves endured. Uh, 622414 and 32 cents. That is uh, what, what we incurred with highways, culverts, uh, buildings, uh, everything on the county level. So uh, when we were asking people so that we could hit uh, the, uh, the plateaus needed for the federal government, uh, these are the kind of numbers that we wanted. Uh, and uh, sorry to report here that I personally talked to at least 10 people that didn't report damage. Um, and some substantial damage that they didn't because they said, oh, I wasn't insured here and here. And what I said at our committee meeting, they could not have been told more times. We, as a county, the state government, the Milwaukee television, everyone did a beautiful job of informing people. The meetings held in Silver Lake, the meetings held at Salem Lakes, the meetings everywhere were begging people, begging them. And from what I've heard, we're not even going to be close. And I, like I said, I personally know, I know a gentleman that had over $100,000 worth of damage just this, uh, just um, um, west of Silver Lake that said, no, nah, I didn't have a report, I didn't report anything. You know. So the county did our due diligence. Uh, everyone that works for the county did, and I can't say enough for the, the Red Cross and all the volunteers. Uh, but those are our numbers, $622,000 uh, that, that we not only uh, had to spend, but we also lost a couple weeks of work. So we're, we're trying to catch up on that. So thank you. That's thank you, Supervisor Alberman. Supervisor Dodge, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, wanted to report that I attended the quarterly Kenosha County Veterans Service Commission meeting today and I uh, want to report to our veterans of the work that they've accomplished. Um, today they discussed uh, amendments to their bylaws and presented them and discussed for further action. And also um, aid to needy veterans Expenditures, all our expenditures were reviewed. And I want to report that they have a balance in that account of $13,839 for needy veterans. Um, also, there's going to be a veteran celebration and a stand down set uh, for November 4th. There'll be a lot more in the media on that. And uh, an announcement that they're going to be putting out is if um, any veterans, or dependents of veterans who are in need of a wheelchair or wheelchair accessories, contact our county veteran service officer and he'll fix you up. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dodge. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. 
Thank you, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, the Planning and Development and Extension Education Committee heard a few things in our commit our meeting last Wednesday that will not come before the board. Actually, just one thing: um, a conditional use permit for Brightonwood Orchard to allow retail sales in the A3 agricultural related uh, district in the town of Brighton. Um, at our August 9th meeting, the PDEC heard additional testimony and the applicant, Mr. Stone, who spoke earlier today, agreed to connect the north access driveway to the existing loop south by December 31st, 2018. The committee then reconfirmed approval of the CUP request for Brightonwood Orchard. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no other lights, we'll move on with our business. County Executive Appointments, Richard Gallo to serve on the Kenosha County Workforce Development Board. Human Services. We've heard of Human Services. <laughs> Old Business, Ordinance 9 from the Planning Development and Extension Education Committee, Ordinance regarding Brighton Woods Orchards Incorporated owner, William H. Stone Agent, request an amendment to the adopted land use plan map for Kenosha County, 2035 map 65 of the comprehensive plan from farmland protection, PEC and SEC, to general agricultural and open land, PEC and SEC, town of Brighton. Decker, yes, Poole, yes, Skalitsky, excused, Gilmore, yes, Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. Move Ordinance 9, please. I have a first by Supervisor Decker and a second by Supervisor Poole. For Supervisor Decker. This property is located on the west side of County Highway B, 288th Avenue, approximately one quarter mile north of the intersection with Highway 142 Burlington Road. The comprehensive plan amendment would allow a revision of MAC 65 of the comprehensive plan from farmland protection PEC and SEC to farmland protection, general agricultural and open land, PEC and SEC. After hearing additional, like I said before, after hearing additional testimony and working out traffic concerns with the applicant, Mr. Stone, the PDEC committee reconfirmed approval of this comprehensive plan amendment at the August 9th meeting. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Ordinance 10 from the Planning Development and Extension Education Committee, Ordinance regarding Brighton Woods Orchards Incorporated owner, William H. Stone Agent, request a rezoning from A1 Agricultural Preservation District and C2 Upland Resource Conservancy District to A1 Agricultural Preservation District, A3 Agriculture Related Manufacturing, Warehousing and Marketing District and C2 Upland Resource Conservancy District, Town of Brighton. Decker, yes. Poole, yes. Galitsky, excused. Gilmore, yes. Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. Move Ordinance 10, please. I have a first by Supervisor Decker and a second by Supervisor Bostrom. Supervisor Decker. This is the same property as Ordinance Number 9, and the rezoning would allow for the existing agricultural production operations to continue. That's all. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 28. From the Planning Development Extension Education Committee, a resolution regarding Brighton Woods Orchards Incorporated owner William H. Stone Agent request an amendment to the adopted land use plan map for Kenosha County 2035 map 65 of the comprehensive plan from farmland protection PEC and SEC to general agricultural and open land PEC and SEC town of Brighton. Decker, yes. Poole, yes. Galitsky, excused. Gilmore, yes. Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. Move resolution 28, please. I have a first by Supervisor Decker and a second by Supervisor Poole. Supervisor Decker. Again, this is the same property as ordinance number nine. And um, the state requires a resolution from the Planning Development and Extension Education Committee and an ordinance from the Phillip County Board to amend the comprehensive plan. So these go to hand in hand, that's all. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion passes. New business, ordinance 12 from the Planning Development Extension Education Committee, an ordinance regarding Arthur A. Neighbor and Paul J. Neighbor requesting a rezoning from A2 General Agricultural District and C1 Lowland Resource Conservancy District to A2 General Agricultural District, R2 Suburban Single Family Residential District, and C1 Lowland Resource Conservancy District, Town of Wheatland. 
Decker, yes. Poole, yes. Galitsky, yes. Gilmore, yes. Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. Move ordinance 12, please. I have a first by Supervisor Decker and a second by Supervisor Skalitsky. Supervisor Decker. Thank you. This property is located on the northwest corner of the intersection of 75th Street and Lily Lake Road. The rezoning would uh, allow a four lot land division of an approximately 29.3 acre parcel. The town of Wheatland recommended approval of the request. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 32 from the Finance and Administration Committee, a resolution authorizing and providing for the sale and issuance of 13,255,000 general obligation promissory notes, series 2017A and all related details. Rose, yes. Ron Fr Frederick, yes. Kabicki, yes. Retzloff, yes. Esposito, yes. Gens, yes. Dodge, yes. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I would move resolution uh, 32. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Ron Frederick. Supervisor Rose. All right, thank you. The uh, proposal before you uh, is authorizing, providing for the sale and issuance of 13,255,000 general obligation promissory notes. These uh, have been given uh, a top rating, uh, AA plus by uh, Fitch and Standard and Poor's. Uh, they were very favorably impressed with the presentation that was made by the county executive, our finance uh, directors, and uh, our advisors from Ehlers, and uh, the vice chairman and myself as chair of the finance committee. Uh, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mike Harrigan, chairman of Ehlers, uh, as uh, he will, I think he deserves a lot of credit uh, for the excellent results we have received from the sale. And if you would, uh, Chair, call upon him to make a presentation. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Mr. Harrigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. And thank you, County Board members, for the opportunity to be here tonight to present to you the results of the bidding that we conducted on your behalf today in the marketplace for these bonds. Uh, this $13,255,000 promissory note issue received a total of nine bids in the marketplace today. Uh, the low bid was uh, submitted by the City Group, uh, City Group Global Markets out of Dallas, Texas, and their bids, winning bid was uh, an interest rate of 1.7974% uh, for 10-year money. Uh, this is the second lowest uh, bidding uh, environment we've seen uh, on bonds uh, of this nature and uh, the number of bids reflects the fact that uh, the county was a very uh, highly sought product in the marketplace today. Uh, by way of explanation I can tell you that uh, we were estimating the uh, rates uh, for planning purposes in the range of about a 2.2 percent uh, and as a result of the low uh, the lower interest rates that you did receive uh, the uh, uh, total principal and interest uh, on this first issue, the uh, 2017A, is a, a little over $233,000 less than our original pre-bid estimate. So uh, I think your objective was met. You may recall that you adopted the initial resolution for these bonds, both the bonds and the notes, last fall when you adopted your budget and that passed by a three-quarter vote of the county board. So today we're really just executing the, the process in the marketplace and does recall, require a roll call, but a majority vote will suffice on, on, the, uh, on the motion. So thank you for the chance to be uh, working for you on this one. It was exciting in the market today. Thank you, Mr. Harrigan. You're welcome. Mr. Rose, did you have anything? Uh, no, nothing further. This, uh, we, the committee uh, calls for your endorsement. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Bostrom, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If uh, Mr. Harrigan could come back to the uh, podium, please. I, I was paying attention, but I, I need you to repeat what you said. You were anticipating for these 10-year notes 2.2%. Correct. And they came in at what again? 1.797%. 1. I mean, you see the jaw hitting the floor, right? I mean, I, can you explain the strong, de the strong demand that would push 
the yield down so far? I mean, that, I'm sorry, well, folks, that, this, this is a, a significant number. I can tell you that, again, the way that this county has gone about uh, its business in the bond market, you're a regular annual issuer in the bond market. Underwriters and banks know Kenosha County. They follow the Kenosha County. The county has made a concerted effort to conduct its business and affairs in a very responsible way. The county is board has acted as a steward of this. You've maintained a strong fund balance. The fact that you've got a double A rating, which is just the one step below triple A, the best you can get, from both Standard, Standard and Poor's and Fitch. And the reasons for it, by the way, the reasons for that are contained in credit reports that are in your packet. And you can read, I would recommend all the members of the board to read those credit reports because they really get into a lot of the reasons here. But by way of explanation, uh, Supervisor, the range in bids from top to bottom here went from a 1.79 to 2.002%. Mm. What this tells us is that when you go through a competitive sale process like this, again, the old commercial, LendingTree.com, when banks compete, you win. It works in, in the bond market, too. Oh, of course, but I, I think it, it can't be emphasized enough that the county of Kenosha yields so much better credibility in the bond market than the United States government by a half a basis, a half a basis point is kind of, kind of exciting. I mean, I'm kind of a bond geek. You probably already know that, but I, mean, I, I share your enthusiasm. I mean, this is actually very good news. And very good news. Thank you for your hard work, and thank you to everybody else that uh, pitched in on this. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Anything else, Supervisor Bostrom? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other lights. All those in favor say aye. 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 Roll call has been requested. Motion passes unanimously. Resolution 33 from the Finance and Administration Committee, a resolution authorizing and providing for the sale and issuance of 5,315,000 general obligation law enforcement enhancement bonds, series 2017B, and all related details. Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Kabicki, yes. Retzloff, yes. Esposito, yes. Gens, yes. Dodge, yes. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. I would move resolution 33. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Retzloff. Supervisor Rose. All right, again, these uh, uh, notes uh, finance the uh, budget uh, items that we've discussed and passed in this year's budget. I would just like to bring to your attention some of the points that Fitch Ratings uh, makes in its report, and you can see that at page nine attached to uh, each one of the resolutions. Uh, they note, first of all, that we have a very strong operating performance. They've given us AAA there. They said, quote, Fitch regards the county's operating performance as exceptionally strong. The county has steadily augmented its general reserve and cash during the current economic expansion. Under the category of long-term uh, liability burden, and this is something that a number of people have talked about and been concerned about uh, for a number of years, Fitch notes that the county benefits from a moderate long-term liability burden, unquote. And if you compare what we owe to what the state says we are capable of borrowing, it is quite significant. Our total indebtedness round numbers is 121 million, and at least according to state standards, and I'm not suggesting that we have to meet these state standards, but the capacity that the state legislature has authorized is up to $575 million, uh, and that's, we're significantly below that number. Fitch also made, uh, notes here that since 2009, our unemployment uh, rate has declined markedly, 
as new and varied employees, employers have moved in and generated greater economic diversification. Economic diversification has always been one of the traditional issues in this community, uh, dating back to the early 1900s when all of the great industrial companies uh, came here to Kenosha and then left, and we were left with the efforts to economically develop this community what it, to what it is today. That again is a economic resource factor that Fitch and Standard and Poor's in their reports notes. So with that, uh, I would urge your endorsement. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A roll call has been requested. Motion passes. Resolution 34 from Supervisor Rose, a resolution calling on the Wisconsin State Legislature to support the Foxconn proposal. Also, Supervisors Skalitsky, Poole, Retzloff, Wambolt, Brunig, Esposito, Kabicki, Frederick, Berg, Bostrom, Dodge, Gens, and Gable. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. I. Uh, the motion, please. Yes, I understand. That. I would move sup uh, ex resolution number 34. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Decker. Supervisor Rose. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I have asked uh, our finance director, David Gersten, and Michael Harrigan again, our chairman of uh, Ehlers, who advises us on economic issues, to come here this evening because I think they have some facts that. Uh, would be very helpful to you in voting on this issue this evening and very supportive of the resolution. With the, uh, your consent, uh, uh, Chair, I would like to uh, call upon Mr. Harrigan and Mr. Gersten to speak to the resolution, and then I have some facts to uh, give you as well. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Mr. Harrigan, Mr. Geertsen, whichever one wants to go first. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll go first. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Rose. And also, uh, thank you, Supervisor Rose, for uh, the initiative of uh, sponsoring Resolution 34. Um, I, I'm the, as the CFO of Kenosha County, I support uh, Resolution 34. Um, I heard from uh, an M7 official that uh, in our region and in our state would be the largest uh, private economic development project ever undertaken in the history of our country. So I heard that from an M7 official. Um, I was at a meeting at the Calatrava, and I heard uh, officials from the state and from Foxconn talk about uh, our region becoming um, uh, uh, potential for a global uh, tech zone. So I, I heard them talk about that. Uh, makes me harken back to the days of Palo Alto in the 60s and 70s when they were emerging as the Silicon Valley. Um, it would be uh, interesting if that could happen here in the Midwest. Um, I, uh, uh, when I, as an official, I, I'm also an elected official with the Village of Summers and I did a uh, economic development study for them uh, right during the Great Recession. And one of the things I saw that would benefit the whole community would be uh, continued diversification in our tax base. And this would uh, definitely help meet that goal, uh, help bring additional commercial and manufacturing to our tax base. So it would help with the diversification of our tax base. Um, we talk about the bond rating. Uh, the bond rating isn't an end-all or be-all, but it's a litmus test for how we're doing an independent evaluation, w one of many independent evaluations that the county under, under is, uh, undergoes. And uh, uh, while it would be nice to enjoy lower cost of money, which we would get 
if we got a AAA, it's really the litmus test uh, aspect of this that is of value. And the bond raters uh, do think that this would uh, improve the economy here. Um, we've heard uh, uh, statistics that have been gone public. The average wage would be in the mid-50s. Um, one of the things that we continue to, uh, that continues to be a challenge here is our average wage is 88% of the national average uh, in our county. Uh, and that uh, a, a, the household, I'm talking household income, not average wage. Household income is in the mid 50s. Uh, nationally, we're at 88% of that. With Foxconn, I saw two different evaluations. One, would, we would be in the mid-50s just for the average income of one job. And then in another study done by Baker Tilly, that would be 64,000. So those uh, individual incomes would exceed the average household income and certainly the 88% that we have here. And uh, according to the ev evaluation of uh, the bond raters, this is one area that we still have progress to make. So this would help us with that, help with the prosperity of our community if we could chip away at that. Um, the other thing I saw in the Baker Tilly evaluation is um, the workers that would be hired here would tend to stay here. They would tend to be residents of uh, Wisconsin. Uh, there are reasons cited for that. One is that the average cost of living is lower uh, relative to uh, buying real estate. There are other reasons cited, but the uh, Baker Tilly evaluation did talk about uh, where would the workers come from, where would they end up living, and suggested that they would end up living here. Those are some statistics. Uh, I, I, uh, so again, as the CFO, I support it. I appreciate the board taking, uh, you know, taking this up and giving it consideration. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to our financial advisor, Mike Harrigan. Uh, I intended to do that, but I wanted them to do this intro for me. Okay. Are you making that motion, Terry? Uh, yeah, I was. I was going to after Mr. Harrigan's uh, remarks. I just wanted them to make this intro. Then I was going to move to suspend the rules. Okay. So whatever you please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just indicate that I've had the pleasure of serving as the representative from Ellers uh, as your financial advisor uh, since 1993 here. And I've had the opportunity to be uh, consulted uh, and uh, observe a number of opportunities for economic development in this county and in this area. County, had, let me say to you, and I'm not just saying this because I'm standing here tonight. Kenosha County is respected across the state of Wisconsin. It's a shining star when it comes to the uh, area of its initiatives and economic development. The performance are the envy of many places in this state. Location is a big part of that, of course. And you're blessed by a wonderful place, by, by being in a wonderful place. This company recognized that. You were a part of a competitive process that involved multiple states, and there was a great deal of interest in landing this type of uh, once-in-a-lifetime type of uh, op economic development opportunity. The only thing that comes near to this at all in the state of Wisconsin, and it doesn't, it's, it's a small part of that, it's a project we also worked on, is in the city of Verona, some of you may be familiar with or have heard of the Epic Systems Company. This is a multi-campus company uh, that has been de that developed software for medical systems. The employment there and the tax base <coughs> and the income 
those are three factors that really have made a difference, not just in Verona, but in Dane County and for the state of Wisconsin. This is what we're talking about here in Kenosha. Three things, tax base, jobs, and wages. This company's gonna bring them. There have been two independent evaluations of this thing so far to date. Dave made reference to them. Baker Tilly, most recently, a uh, report published, and you can all get it online. It's, it's published and, and, and it's available to anybody that wants to look it up. Uh, it was commissioned by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation to, to do their diligence as an independent evaluation. The other firm that was referred to is the Ernst & Young firm. And in the Baker Tilly report, they compare each other's analysis so you can, can, can compare one to the other. But I'm just gonna cite a couple of things here. In terms of direct labor income that's projected by Baker Tilly, it's $1,111,000 uh, wages annually. Ernst & Young, $956 million is, is the range. Average wage, $85,000 to $73,000 between Baker and, and Ernst, and that's for the direct labor. The indirect labor, 78 to 56,000, and the induced labor, 48 to 43,000. Both of which add another between 600 and 700,000 million dollars a year to payrolls. We talked about the fact that it's all about increasing incomes for people here, and that's the thing that's gonna count in terms of raising the opportunities and lifestyles for people in this county. We think this is a, an opportunity that's not gonna come around more than once in a generation. Uh, you can accept the uh, challenges that go along with it, of which there's gonna be plenty. And if you approve and adopt this, the state goes forward, the heavy lifting just begins. But I think my experience with Kenosha folks here is that they're up to doing a lot of heavy lifting. And I think if you're willing to do it, the rewards will be there. As your financial advisor, we recommend your favorable consideration of the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrigan. Supervisor Rose, you All right, thank you. I would move to suspend the rules so that the resolution is not referred to the committee, but rather is voted on this evening. Second. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Franco. Oh, I didn't second. second. Oh, Supervisor Sklitsky. I knew I heard the one over here somewhere. <laughs> Supervisor Rose? All right, the only thing I would say on the resolution to spend the rules is that uh, uh, I think we, we know the facts, we have opinions on this. If we refer it to the committee, our, our voice will be lost. The uh, State Assembly is going to vote on this on Thursday, referring it to committee and come back, uh, we're a day late and dollar short. Okay, so I'm going to clear the board and we're gonna discuss the suspension of the rules. Hold on, might not be a debatable. No, it is not debatable. So, all those in. Okay. Are we doing a roll call then? Okay, roll call vote. Yes, two thirds. Yes to suspend the rules, no to send it to committee. Supervisor Rose, did you have anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank those who have uh, joined in, in endorsing and uh, co-sponsoring the resolution before you this evening. I think it's a very important one. I also view it as a nonpartisan one. I understand the opposition and questions about uh, some of the issues here, and I think I, I would hope that I could answer those issues here this evening. Uh, this uh, Foxconn is going to be an assembly plant for one of the most prominent companies in the world, Apple. Uh, along with it, uh, we understand that Corning would also locate a plant here of some four to 500 people. 
whether this is ultimately located in Kenosha or Racine, uh, each community will have substantial benefits. Now, where, did I, where are the facts that uh, I'm going to give you this evening coming from? This morning, I received a telephone call from State Representative Todd Onstead from Madison. He could not be here this evening himself. Uh, he is there in Madison working on this legislation, and he said he was going to be there until the end. But he did want me to know what some of the facts were because he felt, as I do, that uh, there has been a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding uh, about the Foxconn and what they intend to do, and what are the uh, what are some of the safeguards that have been put into the resolution. First, he said, construction jobs will be for about four years uh, in constructing this plant. Some 10,000 workers will be working on that for a period of four years with at least an average income of about $60,000 per year. Uh, water issue has one which has been raised. We've always been kind, very conscious uh, water usage in this community and has spent a lot of time, a lot of money to make sure that we have clean drinking water for our use. And that isn't going to change. Uh, the legislation commits that whatever they put into the lake will come out clean through the water sewage tramp treatment plant here in Kenosha, and Mr. St. Peter, who is the local director, testified to that commitment when he was in Madison with the county executive and the mayor who are both in support of the resolution. This is not a concern that is being ignored, but is a concern that has been and will be addressed if they come to Kenosha. What is the spinoff employment from a plant like this. Mr. Onstead says that it, uh, it is going to be approximately 22,000 jobs. If you look at GE Medical in the Milwaukee area, there are many, many spin-off jobs from uh, GE Medical as well. Some people have said, well, they don't keep their promises. Take a look at Pennsylvania. What Mr. Onstead said was that is that the research that was uh, given was that Pennsylvania never, re never uh, formulated an agreement with them. So that, that really isn't a, uh, a point of concern. Now what about the $3 billion? It's a big number. We're not, the state isn't going to just write them a check. Here's what Mr. Onst Onstead says is the legislation that is to come before the State Assembly on Thursday. First, $1.35 billion will be given to them if they spend $10 billion. If they don't spend that, they don't get it. So the balance of $1.5 billion would not go to them unless they create some 13,000 jobs. If they create less, of course, they're not going to get the full $3 billion uh, that uh, here is promised. So it's a conditional thing. You must produce the jobs before you get the money. And if you don't produce the jobs, you're not going to receive the money. So he says that for every dollar of wages that an employee is going to be paid, uh, the incentive is 17% from the state. Now that's how they arrive at this big number. So for every dollar, 17% incentive. Now under anybody's uh, economics, that is a good investment. If you can invest 17 cents and get back a dollar, that's an excellent investment in any business. Uh, what are the lowest paid jobs going to be here? $20 an hour. Uh, technicians, $25 per hour. Engineers, up to $100,000 uh, a year. Now, any one of those figures is more than competitive with the jobs in this community, and I think we all know it. Uh, there are very few jobs that are offered at that $100,000 plus level. 
or $20 an hour or $25 per hour. Our high income uh, fund was, was uh, created with CABA and is used to encourage better paying jobs in this community. I think we all recognize that that is an issue. So when we're talking about jobs which pay between $30,000 and $100,000 a year, those are very good for Kenosha. And those are the jobs for which incentives uh, are aimed at. The incentives are aimed at the people who are going to be making $30,000 with a cap of $100,000. So if there's a manager at uh, $250,000 or more, that's not involved in this legislation. So we're t again, $30,000 to $100,000 is what the legislation requires to be eligible for this incentive. Again, a lot of people seem to think the state is just going to write a check and off they go and we're holding the bag. That's not the case at all. So if you don't create the job, you don't get the incentive. Environmental issues are important to all of us. And while the governor has stated that he is waiving those for the state, he cannot waive them for the federal government. Mr. Onstead confirms that. I think the attorney general would back that up. Clearly, a governor cannot waive environmental laws for the, fe uh, uh, for the federal government. So there's still the federal air, clean air, clean water, uh, environmental -ish, uh, laws which are applicable to them. Governor can't do anything about that. Let me just talk about one of those environmental laws which has been written up in the paper, wetlands, filling in wetlands. Uh, we've read about that, but what does current law say if you fill in a wetland? If you fill in a wetland, you have to substitute it with 1.2 acres of uh, wetland. So if you take one point, uh, if you take one acre, you have to give back 1.2. That's current law. What does this law have to say that's coming before the assembly? This law says for every acre you have the wetlands, you have to replenish the, the uh, land with two acres. Not point 0.1, point 0.2, but two. That's better than current law. So these were some of the facts that uh, Mr. Uh, Onstead, our state legislator from this district, wanted you to know and communicated them to me. He called me this morning. I didn't put in a call to him, but he wanted to make sure that the facts and some of the misconceptions were addressed by this board and understood so that there was not a rush to oppose this and that he as a legislator and the others who I would hope are in support of this uh, will understand the support that this is receiving this evening. I think it's appropriate for us to take a stand on this. I hope they come here. Uh, if they go to Racine, uh, we certainly will have substantial benefit. And the last point I would say is this. When we appeared before Fetch and Standard and Poor's, they were very favorably impressed that we were under consideration for this. They didn't look upon this as a negative, but rather a very positive area of economic development. Mr. Battle does as well. He's not here this evening because of another commitment, but he would certainly join in the ringing endorsement that we have heard this evening from Mr. Gersten and Mr. Harrigan. They've never steered us wrong. They've always presented the uh, economics to this board and to the Finance Committee in a very objective fashion. And they let the chips fall where they may. And they believe, as I do, that the benefits outweigh the detriments. Uh, we have seen companies come and go. We've had the first industrial revolution, as I said many times before, when the great industries came here and then they closed. And there were some who would have said that Kenosha was a thing of the past, and I've heard that as you have many times before. But our recovery has been great because we have diversified, because we have taken chances. And this is part of that development, a development which is in the direction of technology which we have not seen before. And we are hopeful that this is the beginning, not the end. And that the company like Corning, which is one of the foremost 
technology companies in this country is one company that is a spin-off from this kind of development if we have the incentive this evening to endorse it. I believe that this is our time, but I would also say it is about time. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Franco, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I find it interesting all the constant references uh, by Supervisor Rose to um, Representative Onstead. You get the impression that uh, uh, Representative Onstead voted for this bill. He didn't. Um, though I hope that the optimistic scenario that is painted by this re resolution comes to pass, I believe the price of the deal that Wisconsinites will have to pay is just too high. Just yesterday, I watched the majority of the State Assembly Jobs Committee summarily reject 23 amendments to the revised bill, all of which would have strengthened protections for taxpayers and the environment, as well as ensuring a living wage and worker protections. They were not even considered. And as a result, five members of the committee voted no on the bill, one of which is our own representative, Todd Onstead, who is the ranking member of the committee. Now the bill is proceeding at warp speed to the full chamber and a vote is scheduled for this Thursday. Even Assembly Minority Leader Peter Barca in last Saturday's Kenosha News expressed concerns that the bill is being pushed through way too quickly without sufficient community scrutiny. Considering the massive scale of this deal, time is needed to address concerns since so many things are still in flux. Keep in mind, the agreement between the governor and Foxconn is a memorandum of understanding and can be revised and is not legally binding. There are many moving parts and legitimate questions still unaddressed. The issue of the $3 billion subsidy, which apparently will take 25 years or more for the state to break even. The borrowing of $252 million for roads when our own state transportation budget is a billion dollars in the hole. The issue of allowing Foxconn to opt out of state and federal environmental standards. And last but not least, this is all being done while we still don't have a state budget yet. To put one issue in perspective, the state is going to have to pay about $250 million in refundable tax credits to Foxconn over 15 years. However, tax receipts are expected to be only $181 million per year, which is a negative differential of almost $70 million roughly a little over a billion dollars of taxpayer money given to Foxconn over 15 years. The numbers you see in this resolution are based on an expected multiplier effect of indirect jobs and increased revenue, which is only anticipated and many say overly optimistic. The state has until September 30th to make a deal with Foxconn. I'm aware that this is time sensitive, but as a county supervisor, I must have a good idea of not only the potential economic benefits, but also the social and environmental impact of my constituents before I vote on anything. And now it appears that the bill is going to proceed to the assembly without any further amending and will more than likely pass along a party line vote. I suspect the same will occur in the state Senate as well, now that a few revisions were made last week to mollify Leader Fitzgerald in the Senate. Let me be clear. And I want to be on the record when saying this. I hope all of the projected rosy economic benefits of this deal will come to fruition. The economic impact could potentially be enormous for Kenosha and southeastern Wisconsin. Unfortunately, this resolution only considers the benefits to the county and state, but ignores legitimate concerns in regard to the overall price Wisconsin taxpayers will have to pay. My reservations have to do with what is not stated in the uh, resolution. In short, I cannot say if Foscon will be a good a deal for Kenosha County if one only isolates the potential economic advantages from the price taxpayers will pay and the long-term impact on the environment. But this is what this resolution is asking us to do. All of these factors must be considered together because they're all interrelated. I want the stimulus to Kenosha County as much as anyone. But we can't lose sight of the price all Wisconsinites will have to pay to get it either. Therefore, under the present circumstances and wording of this resolution, I will be voting no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Franco. Supervisor Grady, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to offer a friendly amendment to this proposal we have before us. That's resolution number 34. 
After my reading of the amendment, if I could have a second, I would elaborate upon it. The amendment reads as follows, and I am just reading the amended portion. Whereas an efficient modern interstate highway system is essential to Foxconn and all of southeastern Wisconsin business and residents, and whereas the Wisconsin Legislature and Wisconsin Department of Transportation has previously promised to improve the Kenosha Racine segments of Interstate Highway 94, and if you read along with me, the next part has already been in place, concludes Foxconn build a facility in the southeastern Wisconsin. And the amendment further states, and the legislature's promise to improve the Kenosha Racine segments of Highway State, of Interstate Highway 94. If I could get a second, I'd speak on that. Second. Okay. I have a first by Supervisor Grady and a second by Supervisor Decker. Decker. Very well, thank you. When you take a look at all the ingredients that go into a deal such as Foxconn's, you have to think that the highway system is very, very crucial. And not just for Foxconn, but any for any industry, any enterprise who wants to locate in this area, needs good transportation. We've had the uh, expansion from the state line, partially through Kenosha County. Racine County does not have the expansion that was promised. Instead, what happened, the schedule was changed around a little bit, and the Marquette Interchange took precedence, which is fine, needed to be done. Again, we're supposed to have the expansion through Kenosha and Racine County. Didn't happen. The zoo interchange took precedence. But at some point in time, if we're to remain economically viable and truly be the leader that we need to be, we will have to have this addressed. And as long as you're making an advisory recommendation to our state legislators, this should be a part of it. And I do want to further say to all the members here in this room and to our audience who's attending, to our fellow citizens, this is an advisory resolution. We can cajole, preach, have as much opinion as we wish in this room, but in the end, it's going to be the legislature that makes a decision on their own criterion. That is my amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. I'm going to clear the board, and anyone who wants to speak on the amendment can go ahead and push their lights. Seeing no lights, all those in favor of the amendment? Oh, Supervisor Ron Frederick. Uh, on this amendment, it seems to me that there isn't the part of the deal with Foxcom there that uh, the count the state has to do some improvements on on the I system. In Milwaukee, isn't there something on that, for, for Supervisor? Uh, isn't there something on that as far as Milwaukee getting, having to do something to meet the requirements of Foxconn? You know, that very well may be the situation. I can't comment upon that, but that will still be further down the road than where we're at now. And at least for us to go on record to say that we support this certainly has no negative effect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other lights, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We will move on. Supervisor Bostrom, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, um, but there's a couple of things I do want to chime in about. Um, and. I know most of you already know my resume, but for uh, those in the audience, uh, I am a former Kenosha Water Utility Board of uh, Commissioner. I am the current uh, Kenosha Regional Airport uh, Chairman, and I, for a living, I uh, sell real estate and develop real estate. That said, the Kenosha Water Utility has for the last 20 years had an excess capacity to deliver water to the citizens of Kenosha County of about 17 million gallons a day. They made these infrastructure improvements a number of years ago in preparation for a, uh, a power plant that was never built. So the potential for significant investment 
to accommodate this from the water utilities perspective, um, while there will be some, it's, it's minimal. We have the capacity to service them. Additionally, uh, as part of the development, uh, Foxconn intends to uh, build a water filtration plant on site because they want to recycle the water so as to not drain everything from Lake Michigan. Um, as far as the additional companies or other benefits of development that will happen if we're blessed with it here in Kenosha or in Racine, either way, there's a significant amount of light on Kenosha County. My office alone, and there are many commercial brokers, not only in this town, but in this part of uh, southeast Wisconsin. My office alone is fielding at least one, if not two, phone calls from uh, international and multinational developers. I can tell you there's, a, uh, Chairman Rose mentioned uh, Corning is one potential development. There's two others that I know of, personally. So don't underestimate what this $10 billion investment will throw off an additional investment. Don't discount the number of construction jobs, not just tied to this development, but in the building of additional housing. I don't know if any of you are aware, but we do have a housing shortage nationally and here as well. It's actually somewhat mind-boggling when you think about it. Foxconn themselves, as part of their development, and I haven't spoken with the chairman himself, but I've heard that um, he is very fond of what's called Smart City Initiative. As part of this development, they would like to create a rather significant housing complex so that their employees have a place to live. Eco-friendly, walking community, all these things that we talk about that we'd love to do if we had unlimited funds. Here it is. I wouldn't necessarily toss aside the, ideal, uh, the idea of env environmental impact. And I think when, when spoken about just in those terms, yeah, it can be scary. But the majority of the rules that may be suspended or eased is really di directed at the speed of development. As our financial advisor mentioned, a development this size certainly has never come to this state, probably not even in the entire country. So imagine developing somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 acres. And what the DNR could potentially stand in the way of could be years, could be decades. So some of those rules that are being relaxed are designed to speed the process up. And not at light speed something greater than DNR speed. Um, I have no doubt that if this does happen, which I think it will, and I think Kenosha will get it, we are in for some really exciting times in the next decade. And I'll remind folks, way back when, this is before I was in this community, but way back when, when Chrysler pulled out and there was a significant unemployment situation here. Some of our predecessors were pretty bright and decided that they had to come up with a plan to diversify employment. And they created what you see in Whist Park in Pleasant Prairie. They created the Kenosha Business Park. Those parks were built with tax incremental money, tax incremental financing money, which is tax, tax, taxpayer borrowed money. And the original scale, uh, schedule to payback 
was 20 years for BPOC and WISPARC. They were wildly su successful and were paid off in half the time. I'll also remind you that Amazon, when they came here, $250 million inv investment in this city. Just the city of Kenosha alone gave, the, gave them $25 million to develop here. And I think Chairman Rose mentioned something to the effect of the Foxconn incentive equates to, is it 17 cents on the dollar, I think he said? Just the city of Kenosha alone gave 10 cents on the dollar. So, while I appreciate the, the opinions of those that have spoken tonight, um, I, I cert certainly hope that um, 10 years from now we'll all look back and say what a great idea, idea this was. And I think we will. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Bostrom. Supervisor Blau, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a stake in creating strong and prosperous communities. Investing in the economic stability of our state is a top priority for our fa friends, families, and neighbors of all political persuasions. Our Wisconsin economy must be built on rewarding hard work and innovation and creating more opportunities for our small businesses to grow and reach their full potential. I want to go on record that I am uh, in full support of jobs and a strong economy for Wisconsin, but not at the expense of Wisconsin taxpayers, at the expense of transparency, and the expense of the environment. Unfortunately, the scales of our economy are often t uh, too often tipped towards benefiting major corporations rather than investing in our homegrown businesses. As talks regarding the Foxconn proposal continue, we must ensure that we stick to our core Wisconsin values and ensure that we are getting the best deal for our state. We must protect Wisconsin taxpayers and our shared lands and lakes. As it stands now, this bill is proposing that we hand over $3 billion to Foxconn with no guarantee that Wisconsinites will get their money back if they fail to create jobs for our neighbors. According to the nonpartisan Legislative Fiscal Bureau, Foxconn will cost the state more than the tax money that will be brought in until the 2032-33 fiscal year. Even worse, under the best case scenario, they project that it will take until 2043 for taxpayers to break even on the multi-billion dollar project under the best case scenario. Other costs for our state and local governments include a troubling $50 million in lost sales tax revenue. In addition, Wisconsin would only recoup our billions in 25 years if the company actually makes good on its 13,000 jobs promise and if all of those employed are actually Wisconsinites. With a proposed plant location near the Illinois border, this seems unlikely. Illinois, who won't have to commit to any of their, commit any of their tax money, would reap the benefits of taking these jobs and income taxes for their state. Legislators need to know the exact location of the plant before striking a deal. Despite a budget impasse with transportation borrowing at the center of the issue, the bill proposes to expand the I-94 area near the region being considered for a plant location costing $408 million. Of this, Governor Walker proposes to borrow $252 million. With the transportation deficit in nearly $1 billion already, most Wisconsinites agree that this is a lot for one foreign company with no history in our state. Some of the handouts designed specifically for Foxconn would be overseen by the scandal-plagued Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, or WEDEC, an organization with past problems in regards to tracking job creation and failing to recoup money from companies who outsource jobs. The Racine Journal Times recently outlined some of the dangerous carve-outs blindly given to Foxconn under this proposal, including a free pass to ignore many of our state's environmental safeguards. The Foxconn proposal being pushed by Governor Walker and President Trump would be designated as a special electronics and information and technology zone, essentially meaning that no state environmental impact statement would be required for Foxconn and they would not need a state permit to fill wetlands, wetland areas or destroy the natural path of our rivers and streams. We need to be leery of this deal. Foxconn has a checkered history on delivering promised jobs as the citizens of Pennsylvania can attest. Special Session Assembly Bill 1, uh, which is the bill that is going through, 
had its first and only public hearing a couple of weeks ago. And then yesterday, I also watched the Jobs and Economic uh, Committee hearing and noted that the Republicans in the Assembly rejected all 23 amendments offered, offered by the Democratic Committee members. These amendments would have ensured that Boxconn was held accountable for actual job performance, measurement of jobs created at or above the promised numbers, and wages with clawbacks requiring the paying of back taxes if the jobs and investments are not kept in Wisconsin. All of these safeguards proposed to protect our state were rejected. And as I said in the beginning, and uh, while I note that this is an advisory referendum, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that you know once they do come here, that I will be proven wrong and that it will be successful, but as the bill stands right now, I will not be voting for it. I am in full support of jobs and a strong economy for Wisconsin, but not at the expense of Wisconsin taxpayers, at the expense of transparency or the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Holman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't really believe, Madam Chair, that I can support this. Um, I noted visiting a school not too long ago um, that serves primarily poor students, a school where the students are on free and reduced lunch um, at a concentration of about 80, 90 percent. And I had brought a case of paper with me, 10 reams, and brought it to one of the teachers and she said, I'm going to have to hide this. I said, why? She said, well, because ever since the state took a billion dollars out of education, we don't have enough paper to teach our kids. So. My eyebrows go up when a company comes along and all of a sudden my state can seem to find three billion in the couch cushion somewhere to seemingly hand over to say, hey, let's make this happen. Um, I do think that Kenosha County can be the Silicon Valley of the Midwest, but I certainly don't think this is the way to do that. Um, I have a friend of mine who's on the Palo Alto City Council right now. He talks about how having those tech companies, Google, literally in his backyard, has changed his communities, how that's changed the housing values, how there's a large influx of people which college, with college degrees that weren't necessarily there before. Um, you know, I think we can become the Silicon Valley of the Midwest, Madam Chair, but I don't think Foxconn is the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Holman. We're going right down the row. Supervisor Dodge, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, a lot of discussion on this, whether it be taxpayer support money, um, environmental <clears throat> impact. Well, one thing that um, nobody has mentioned, so I'll try to keep this short, is what about those 13,000 people that get the dignity of getting a job? There's going to be 13,000, whether whether they come from other jobs and they fill those vacancies, 13,000 people that won't be on the public trough that will be have the dignity to provide for their family. Right now, you've got a lot of people that are doing well and some living paycheck to paycheck, but they have the dignity of earning their way. 13,000 people earning their way off the public trough. I, I, I can't not support this. I, I think it's, it's, it's a win. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dodge. Seeing no other lights, there has been a roll call requested. Yes, if you are in favor of the resolution, no if you are not. Supervisor Bostrom, <laughs> push harder. <laughs> there you go. Motion passes. Resolution 35 from Supervisor Blau and the Legislative Committee, a resolution supporting the ruling invalidating state legislative maps and ordering new ones. White Frederick, yes. Hallman, yes. Berg, yes. Decker, no. Franco, yes. Poole, no. Skalitsky, no. Supervisor Boyd Frederick, you have the floor. Move Resolution 35. I have our first by Supervisor Frederick and a second by Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Frederick. I'll start off and then I'll pass it over to Supervisor Blau. But this resolution basically requests that the Senate and Assembly draw new maps and fair maps for the 2018 legislative session. This, we are not alone in this request. We would be the 22nd county in the state to pass pretty close to the same resolution asking for the state by the 2018 election to 
have these new maps. This will go in front of the Supreme Court on October 3rd of this year, and our vote will also be included in the discussion of during that time. Uh, Supervisor Blau, if you would like to go on from there. Supervisor Blau, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Frederick and Madam Chair. This resolution is asking the county board to support the Western Wisconsin Federal Court's decision ru uh, ruling against the current Wisconsin electoral district map, which was drawn by Republican lawmakers after the 2010 census. These maps were determined by the court to be unconstitutional and abuse of power. Wisconsin Attorney General Brad Schimmel has decided to spend $2 million in counting of our taxpayer dollars on outside counsel for an appeal to the federal court uh, decision instead of the right for all constituents to have a say in who represents them. Interestingly, at the Legislative Committee, one supervisor referred to this $2 million as a drop in the bucket. I don't know about you, but, you know, I don't have $2 million, and uh, I don't know if anybody here in the room would consider that a drop in the bucket, but you know, that's, you know, I guess, his opinion. Um, indeed, we are a nonpartisan board, but the current voter maps have been determined to be extremely partisan by the federal courts. Therefore, nonpartisan voter maps are in order. I'm not sure why the opponents of this resolution initially are so afraid of it. Why would anybody be afraid of fair voter maps? All constituents deserve a voice. That is why I'm representing this resolution. The Kenosha County Board is an extension of the state, and the county board members represent the people of Kenosha County. This abuse of power at the expense of one voice, one vote, is not acceptable. This is about fairness and providing a voice for the voter. And as far as the Supreme Court hearing of uh, Gill versus Whitford taking place this October, this is related and important, but the decision is not a sufficient solution to our problem here in Kenosha or in the state of Wisconsin. That case would determine whether or not our current state assembly maps are constitutional or not, and would create a standard by, uh, by which to measure this by. But this case has nothing to do with the process by which the state of Wisconsin chooses to draw its maps now and in the future. If we do not change the process now, before the new maps are drawn before the 2020 census, then the state legislature, regardless of the party, will likely rig our elections again for the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Grady, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question through the chair to whoever in the room might be more knowledgeable than myself. It's my understanding that the federal courts have said that the way the districting was done was not proper, and they're asking to be redrawn. Is this new? Has this ever happened in our nation before where the federal courts have to weigh in and tell a district or a state that they have to do it differently? Does anyone know? Supervisor Boyd Frederick. Well, actually, the first time they had to do this goes back to the Pendergast and going back to the 1800s. Then they did a litmus test to see how far something could be gerrymandered in order to be legal. And right now the Western Court has said that it has gone too far gerrymandering in the state of Wisconsin to uh, allow this, the current maps to stay the same. So we have one opinion from one supervisor that this has only happened, what, back in the 1920s? No, actually, it started in the 1800s. It, it, it has been in the courts three separate times, I think, in the last uh, 10 years. But this is the first time the Supreme Court has taken up a all right, so just for myself and the other supervisors understand, this is rather unprecedented. Is it also then on the Supreme Court's docket, they have agreed to hear this case in October, our case, mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So here we are in this unique position of having, I suppose, the nation focused upon us because the way the lines were drawn are so obviously out of kill, out of norm, that the feds have to weigh in. All right, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. Supervisor Bostrom, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I um, have always had a long-standing rule going, going back to my city council days of uh, not voting for things that uh, I, I consider to be partisan. Uh, someone injecting their own political beliefs into a 
partisan body. City Council was the same. That said, I don't, I hope you don't read into this too much. I'll explain exactly where I'm going. I'm as offended by a political party that feels the need to draw a map to benefit themselves as I am by a party that feels it's so unfair we have to redraw them because it it says to me that you think the voters don't have a brain that the voters can't think for themselves and I, I saw a social media meme the other day that that I think really kind of hones in on the point that I'm that I'm talking about I haven't been able to independently verify whether or not this is true but I can believe it the meme went something along this line that in this last presidential election if there was a category for Republican Democrat or did not vote did not vote would have won 491 electoral votes and you should be proud that the state of Wisconsin was one that was not in that category they actually voted they actually had more voters than did not vote so that's why I say that if I think the focus should be on what your message is now that said I'm not opposing this for partisan issues partisan beliefs I'm opposing this for two reasons number one Supervisor Grady asked the question had the Supreme Court ever heard something like this before and yes they had in 2004 the Veith, Veith versus Jubler I probably butchered that name was a uh, case in Pennsylvania that went to the Supreme Court and it was not ruled unconstitutional but listen to, listen to the reasons why the nine justices were split four justices in plurality believed it was impossible to define a standard to judge partisan gerrymandering while four others could not agree that an existing standard to be used that, that there was not an existing standard that could be used to justify it only uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy was in concurrence with the plurality he believed that some manageable standard for determining partisan gerrymandering could be developed but challenged the lower courts to come up with this my point for mentioning this is is that it's not just as simple as it's not fair redraw it it's a it's a much bigger issue and personally I would love to see this taken out of political parties hands I think that's appropriate I think it is so that's that's the number one reason why I'm not voting for yeah. this is that please keep your comments even, to yourself even the Supreme Court justices feel it's not as simplistic but the biggest reason redistricting in the state of Wisconsin is supposed to start at the ward level which is in the municipalities city of Kenosha village of Pleasant Prairie village of Summers they draw their wards then the counties then draw their districts around that and then it goes to the state level in 2011 this board took the city of Kenosha to court because they didn't like the ward boundaries that the city drew it cost the city a hundred thousand dollars I'm not sure what it cost the county I suspect something more than that eventually a compromise was reached a major lawsuit was averted but I can tell you I cannot in good conscience support this resolution as it talks about wasting money in a frivolous lawsuit as a member of this body 
and a member of the previous body that was involved in it, I cannot in good conscience do that. So I will not. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Bostrom. Supervisor Hallman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make an amendment to this if I could, and if somebody would second it, I can explain why. Uh, the text of it you have on your desks. I can, I can state where state, it goes. You have to state the amendment. Uh, the amendment would read as follows. It would replace on page two, it would replace the fourth paragraph that says, be it further resolved. The change would read as follows. Be it further resolved that the Kenosha County Board of Supervisors calls for the process of drawing new state legislative maps to promote more accountability and transparency in that it prohibit the consideration of voting patterns and incumbents residents information and shall retain only as necessary to ensure minority participation as required by the U.S. Constitution, demographic information such as race, economic status, or gender in drawing the maps. I have a motion on the floor by Supervisor Hallman. I have a second by Supervisor Blau. We'll go ahead and open up to discussion. Let me clear the board Let's first. Hallman stay this point. Yeah. Okay, Supervisor Hallman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, naturally, uh, as, as I'm sure we can uh, all imagine, and maybe some of you heard the audio from committee, uh, this resolution generated a great deal of discussion. There were some concerns expressed by committee members. Um, so I tried to sort of work with the language and work with Supervisor Blau to find something that um, I feel like is more reflective of the redistricting process that we as a county board did. Uh, with the rules as far as redistricting goes, we're all essentially held to the same standard in terms of what the Supreme Court says we can and cannot do. I feel like the maps we put forward as a county board, they were neat, they were compact, they paid attention to the sensitivity issues around uh, diversity and race in different neighborhoods and geographic region in, in, in quite a substantial way. Mind you, we went through a couple of revisions before we got there, Madam Chair, but we did get there, and I'm very proud of them. So I wanted language that was more reflective of what we had done as a county board because I think we've done a stellar job within the bounds of the laws we currently know it today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hallman. Any other lights to speak on the amendment? Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. Uh, I question of the Corporation Council because this, uh, now we're getting into some technical language and I thought that the more of the resolution was an expression of support for redistricting. This is getting now into legalities and uh, so is this consistent with the case law on this? You reviewed this before? I did. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Supervisor Rose? No. Okay, no other lights. All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? We need a roll call on that one. Is this on the amendment? For Supervisor oh, Sklitsky to get back here. I think Dennis left. No, oh, and then we marked him absent. Because he got up and walked out about 22. He hasn't come back. Oh. That's him? No, that's pretty good. <laughs> Where is he? Voting on an amendment that you missed. Amendment passes. Okay. Now on to the resolution. 
Seeing no lights. Oh, Supervisor Rose. I have nothing to say. I was going okay. to move. Seeing no lights. The roll call has been requested. We are voting on the resolution. Oh, we need a minute to reset. Yes, if you are in favor of the resolution. No, if you are not. <laughs> resolution passes. Please hold your applause. Communications from Andy and Bueller regarding future items scheduled before the Planning Development Ex Extension Education Committee. Receiving file. Approval of the August 1st, 2017 minutes by Supervisor Boyd Frederick. Motion to approve the August 1st minutes. Have a first by Supervisor Boyd Frederick second. and a second by Vice Chair Esposito. All those in favor of the minutes say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. I have a motion from so, Supervisor Kubicki to adjourn and a second by <laughs> Supervisor Vice Chair Esposito. All those in favor to adjourn, say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. I think it is you.